long ways from the table to the board. <laughs> Actually, is I'm worried about the angle here. Should I not? Where's Leo? Should I not worry about that? These sideboards. Is it okay? You know, this board, those people way over there. You know, they can watch it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> This is what we have. This is what we have. Maybe I'll start in the center. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a clock. No, I guess I'll have to look at my watch. Yeah, we'll move it yeah. I didn't look at my watch. Well, I get a little head start here, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Right. So, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is. Uh, Unitary uh, many body quantum dynamics. Thus, you know, so unitary. So, in that sense, uh, the systems are closed, although not strictly closed, as I'll say in a minute. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, in this subject here, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about about thermalization, what that means, how it works, uh, emergence of dissipation, you know, how to think about a closed system undergoing unitary dynamics, so it's perfectly reversible. How does it show irreversible dissipative dynamics? How should we think about that? Um, what does that you know, what does that mean? Um, uh, and this you know, and this includes uh, various kinds of you know, driven. So the, so the reason I put the quotes on the closed is because I will be considering driven systems that are classically driven. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about Floquet systems and their heating properties and what thermalization means in the context of driven systems. Um, and then one system uh, that I'm gonna spend some time on later in the week or one class of problems is uh, many body localization. So, so under this category, I've got quite a few things to say. Um, okay, so we're talking about uh, many body systems. So we have a system, let's say with N, n degrees of freedom. We're interested in, in you know, significantly bigger than one. We often think about the limit n goes to infinity, but not, of course, you know, you don't actually have n goes to infinity in the lab, certainly not in your numerical computations if you're doing exact diagonalization. Um, and so, you know, we're interested in both finite n as well as thinking about the limit of large n. Um, and the limit of large n makes certain things well-defined, whereas at finite n, the distinctions are just crossovers rather than phase transitions. Um, so I'll, ta I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so we, yeah, we have our system. The box around it means it's closed, although it might be driven by a class. So, so we might have a classical system here, which is, which is driving. Um, and of course, there's, I put quotes on classical also because there's no such thing as a classical system. The world is quantum. So this is really a quantum system in a classical limit that's driving, right? Um, okay, now, uh, yeah, so what would these degrees of freedom be? So N spins, qubits, 
trapped atoms, or ions, molecules, or whatever, us, you know, photons. And, and this, this system, you know, it could be in a model or in the lab, right? Of course, ultimately we're interested in this, but we spend a lot of time playing around with models because we're physicists and we know you simplify things, you can make progress. Um, Okay, and of course, you know, as was mentioned, and as you'll hear later this week from some of the experimentalists, you know, many of these systems are being built and studied. You know, the field is really making on the on the experimental side, you know, rapid progress you know, in many different types of systems where you have you know many degrees of freedom and you have a lot of a, you know, a fair amount of quantum control, ability to read out. Um, so these questions we're talking about here, the reason this is a, you know, a school happening now is because of the activity happening, you know, in laboratories all over the world, right? And I think it's important to emphasize that. It's a fun theoretical game to work with, but, you know, none of a, it didn't really get started until, you know, it sort of really got started in some sense because of trapped at, trapped atoms, atoms in optical lattices, and also people trying to build devices for quantum computers. And that opened up just a whole ability to explore these kinds of questions in a way and to think about them in, in ways that just, just hadn't been done before. Um, okay. Good. Okay. Uh, the state of the system, at least what we call the quantum state of the system is a density matrix, rho, which in general would depend on time. We're talking about dynamics. Okay. Now, there is an idealization which we, uh, which is a pure state of the system being in a pure state, rho of t equals psi of t psi of p. Uh, this is an idealization with very helpful theoretically, conceptually, and it's an idealization that, at least in certain circumstances in the lab, you strive for but you never get there. Um, but I think it's important to, you know, we, we work with pure states, you know, you, when you learn quantum mechanics, your teacher probably didn't even mention mixed states for, you know, maybe even in the whole first course, right? But it's always good to keep in mind that pure states are just an idealization. Real systems are in mixed states, particularly when we're doing many body and much bigger than one, right? If you have many degrees of freedom, you know, we have a lot of quantum control, but we don't have such great quantum control that you can take a system of you know, 30 qubits and put it in a pure state. It's just not that good, right? They're, and experimentalists are always measuring their fidelity and their fidelity not being 100% is telling you it's a mixed state, right? It's telling you how much, how close did they get to this idealization? So I'll try to generally talk about mixed states as I go along. Um, yeah, but you know, of course, things are often easier when you talk about pure states, but just keep that in mind that the pure states are just a, an idealization. Okay, so it's, Unitary dynamics. And this is uh, given by a Hamiltonian. 
H, which depends on time. So in general, if we're if the system is driven by something external, but classical, and I'll say a little bit about that more later, we have a Hamiltonian which depends on time, unitary time evolution do that Hamiltonian. Or we have this abstraction of this, of a, a unitary circuit. So for example, you know, we've got some qubits coming in, represented by lines, and then we have some gates, two qubit gates. So this is, this is a type of unitary circuit. You'll see a lot of this month, I guess. Each line represents a qubit. Each box is a gate, which is a unitary operator on these two qubits. It spits out, you know, a state comes in here. It spits out a state at the top. Uh, it gets acted on by the next unitary. Um, and a general unitary circuit would have uh, unitary operators that act at time t. So this, this is continuous time. This has discrete time. Now, of course, a real unitary circuit, the gate is produced by some Hamiltonian. Right. So so this, you know, this in some sense is an abstraction of this, but it's it's convenient often to think of circuits and think of discrete operations. OK. Right. And then the, and then the dynamics, uh, you know, the dynamics is uh, for the Hamiltonian. T. O T, H of T, of T. So that would be um, for the Hamiltonian, and I'll set. I'll uh, just for convenience. When I have a circuit, I will label my time steps as integers, um, and then rho of t plus one is u of t rho of t u dagger t. So rho gets evolved this way uh, when we have uh, unitaries acting on it. That's one, one time step of a circuit dynamics. And then for a pure state, we have the Schrodinger equation, I d psi dt, h bar is one, um, h of t, T and here psi t plus one equals u of t. So that's unitary dynamics. Yeah. Which means quality is different between the discrete version and the new sign version. Very interesting. The the okay, so certain circuit models can be treated analytically for certain properties, right? So a big motivation, well, there's, there's two motivations for thinking about circuits. One is certain quantum information processing devices are traditionally thought about that way. That's one reason to start thinking about circuits. But the other, th the other, the other is that for certain questions, they're easier to answer analytically if you make a circuit dynamics than if you consider a, a more realistic Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, well, and so you can build lots of nice models with circuits and they're easier to work with. You can make get more answers than if you did the equivalent thing in terms of a Hamiltonian. You're, okay. you're allowed to sweep a lot of complications of this under away <laughs> and hide them when you work with circuits. But I'm asking whether the, the situation with the physics is different. Well, really, right, if you have a circuit, right, we don't have discrete time, we have continuous time, right? So this is, you know, this is looking at this at discrete time, right? Okay. So, so, you know, your real circuit 
right? If you, you know, if you actually had it in the laboratory, there would be an H of T, right? And there would be between time T and T plus one, something would be happening, which would be given by this, right? So this is general. This is just looking at it stroboscopically, we say. So this is the stroboscopic dynamics. Now, when you make a model of a circuit and it does something kind of universal, then you have to ask, oh, is this universal in that it would apply to a broad class of Hamiltonians, right? And these are kinds of things people uh, you know, have, have looked at. Um, uh, you know, you know, like if, if you're doing the circuits because they're simpler calculations and you get a result, you know, you want to know, does it apply broadly to Hamiltonians or is it specific to something I did in making, making a simple circuit model? And so this is always something you have to address when you get a result from a circuit, right? It's a question of, of universality. Um, yeah. Where do you see the picture that you have to Well, there's different drawings people make. So this is this is a picture of the this is a drawing of you. Right. So you're, right. you're, this is a drawing of you. Now I could say I could say I put a mixed state in here and feed it through, and then this is a drawing. So this is this here I can also write as a super operator, right? Rho of t plus one. E. This is a linear operation on rho, right? So I could just say, you know, let me let me put a curly u, right? So there's a super operator, which is an operator that acts on a density operator. And there's a curly U, right? And so this picture could be of curly U, and these are the gates which are each U, you know, they're U and U dagger down here, right? So, so there's different pictures you draw. You know, sometimes people draw U, and then they draw U dagger down here and put rho. So you put U here, rho here, U dagger here, and draw a whole diagram. Um, so, so yeah, this, that, that's, there's nothing standard. So, so it's a good question to ask. If you're confused when someone draws a diagram like this, what are they? What specifically are they doing? Um, yeah, ask. Um, but at this point, yeah, this could represent a number of different things. Um, yeah, because it could certainly represent this operator, or it could represent this super operator. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, is there a known example that like? Of a universal like phenomenon like unitary circuit that doesn't carry over the function. Uh, like you mentioned, if you see something universal in the circuit picture, you could be trying to understand whether it also carries over to the Hamiltonian. Like, is there an example that you know it doesn't carry over? Or? No. None comes to mind. You know, I think certainly we worried about that when you know. It isn't that long ago that this subject, you know, this subject used to be all about Hamiltonians. And then at some point, you know, only six or eight years ago, or maybe even less, you know, people said, oh, we should be looking at unitary circuits because they're nicer to work with. And certainly at the beginnings of it, we worried about that a lot. And uh, you'd always ask that question. But you're right. I, I don't, I don't, does any, anybody, can anybody think of a case? Is uh, that uh, are there cases where the circuit is showing some potentially universal behavior, say over a class of circuits, where it doesn't apply to continuous time Hamiltonians? Yeah. Are there, like dual unitary circuits where like all the information is coming from like one, and they actually don't have any Hamiltonian analog. Yeah. So there's an example. Now I would say that's fine tuned, so that's not surprising. Dual unitary circuits are, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not planning on talking about dual unit. Dual unitary circuits are circuits where if you run the dynamics this way, so if I just fold these legs out this way, um, anyways, if you run the dynamics this way rather than this way, it's also unitary, right? 
but this is a very fine-tuned class of unitary cir of, of circuits. And yes, it's it doesn't have a simple correspondence. And but but I would call I wouldn't call that universal. I would call that something very special. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have to define what you mean by you'd have to define what you mean by a ground state over here whereas over here we know what the ground states are that's true so that's yeah that's a, that's a difference yeah but that's really some universal stuff that happens over here that doesn't happen over here so it's the opposite of the question <laughs> but that's a that's a good point <laughs> Uh, stands for infinitesimal time steps, then the unitary state should be very close to identity, but it doesn't have to be the unitary state. Yeah, no, yeah. So, so yeah, one class of unitary circuits are the Trotter approximation. So if you run a Hamiltonian on, the, on a classical computer, you often just break it into a unitary circuit like this, where every gate here is very close to the identity. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about now. You know, here I'm talking about unitary circuits where these gates could be very far from the identity. So it's not like the Trotter approximation. Yeah. Why don't I go on a little bit? I think I'll just stay in the middle board. Just, just to uh, help with the parallax issue. Yeah. I'm worried about him <laughs> and him. <laughs> the, the the extreme tails of the distribution. Okay, so I'll, I'll 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 do that for my next board, and we'll see. And you guys can find a seat in the middle. Actually, I don't I don't see the seats in the middle, but <laughs> there's one right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So so now. You know, we've got these different things. Okay, so there's of course one special case, which is uh, time independent Hamiltonian, not driven. So this is truly closed. And if we have a system that's truly closed and there's not even a classical thing outside of it driving it, then you have a time independent Hamiltonian. Um, Right, and of course, this doesn't exist for the circuits, um, and this has uh, yeah a number of special special properties. So it's of course it's got it's got uh, stationary eigenstates. It's got an uh, extensive conserved energy. Right, if I think of a a bigger and bigger system, you know, this energy will grow with the system in some way, you know, typically just proportional to the size of the system if it's just a, a local, local system. And it, you've got a conserved energy and that energy could be transported. So we might be interested in the transport of that energy. Now we could also have a Hamiltonian with other extensive conserved quantities, which you know, determine the system's thermodynamics and which could also be transported, right? Um, but if you have a time independent Hamiltonian, you definitely have one conserved quantity that's extensive and could be, could be transported. Okay, so, so that's one special case. And then uh, more generally, we have an H of T, 
or a U of T. And then uh, it's uh, driven by uh, an external, some sort of external autonomous dynamics. And, and so what that is in practice in the, in the laboratory, you know, it's, it might be uh, it's typically electromagnetic fields of some sorts, a laser, an RF, microwaves or something. Um, and, and that is a, so the key to keep the dynamics unitary of your system is whatever is outside driving it, your system cannot get entangled with it, right? So, so if your system gets entangled with the thing that's driving it, then the dynamics is not unitary. The system is actually open, right? So, so this external system, which is driving it, has to be a, a quantum system in the classical limit, in a coherent state, it's very large, very highly excited, so that, so that uh, there's no back reaction of your quantum system onto this system that's driving it, which would allow some entanglement to happen, right? So the drive is somehow very big compared to the system it's driving and is unperturbed by it, okay? Now, if it's general, there are no eigenstates. There are no stationary eigenstates. It, well, there's one stationary eigenstate, which is the mixed state, which is the identity. So the mixed state, which is all states equally likely, which is the identity density matrix, is an eigenstate of any unitary dynamics. But if we have a general Hamiltonian or a general circuit, it's not gonna have other stationary eigenstates. It's not gonna have an extensive conserved energy in general. And it may have no extensive conserved quantities and therefore its thermodynamics are just trivial. It's just goes to, if it goes to equilibrium, it goes to the maximum entropy, which is all states equally like Anusha. Well, you have to take a limit. You have to take a limit where the drive is in a coherent state. You take the limit of that coherent state to uh, infinitely uh, infinite number of quanta and turn the coupling down to zero so that the drive remains fixed. And it, that's the classical limit. Well, I guess if you only couple to the coherent state with, you know, linearly, yeah, then you tend not to get entangled with it. But it, let me not answer that. I haven't really thought through that very carefully. Um, but yeah, I may be being too strict. I agree, but I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> but isn't, isn't the whole process of just doing it? Yeah, yeah. So, but that's an example of that, and then that was not. Yeah, people call things classical when they shouldn't call them classic, <laughs> right? Yeah, this is one thing we've learned in the, all this study here is, you, you know, you take a system at high, you know, we used to think a system at very high temperature with many degrees of freedom is classical. That was like a standard thing to say. It's just not true. It's just false, right? And I think that's where you're coming from is, is, 
you know, you haven't unlearned that yet, right? So classical means very specific limits, right? You have to be in coherent states and take the limit of very high quantum numbers, right? Just h bar to zero isn't enough to be classical, right? Because you take h bar to zero, almost all states remain highly quantum. It's only the very special coherent states that become classical. So, so you know, the, the point is, you know, people sometimes call something classical if it's just, oh, I'm not seeing any quantum effects, and they call it classical. But that's, you know, that we should we shouldn't do we shouldn't do that anymore. We shouldn't do that anymore, right? Because, you know, we know there's quantum effects. You know, systems are quantum, right? System, you know, the gas in this room is getting entangled, right? The spins, the add, and the Molecules are scattering off of each other and forming all sorts of quantum correlations, right? They're not, they're not relevant. We can treat it as a dilute gas and treat it classically, and we're going to get pretty much all the physics right. But that doesn't mean it's a classical gas, right? It means it's well approximated by a classical gas. So you're saying this example is different than the one you're talking about the, uh, the drive. Is well, it's a, you know, in order to have unitary dynamics, whatever is driving it cannot be perturbed by the system. Right, because if if different states of the system produce different states of the drive, then we'd be entangled, right? So it's very strict, right? In that whatever is driving it cannot be affected at all by anything going on inside the system, because if the state of the driving agent depended on anything inside the system, that's entangled. Right, and and we can't have that happen if it's really truly unitary, right? Right. Okay. So okay. So this is one special case. This is general. Um, doesn't have this property. This property, and then another special case which I'm going to spend some time on, and so is Anushya, I think. Um, is Floquet systems. Which is a periodic drive. H of T equals H of T plus tau. Some period tau. Omega. Driven at frequency omega to pi over tau. Um, and, you know, these are of interest, of course, you know, first of all, if you apply a, you know, a coherent laser or a coherent RF or microwave with just one frequency that's driving your system, this is what you get. So this, so this arises very naturally in a lot of external drives that people would use in the lab. And, but then also people have learned that by designing drives, you can actually get your Hamiltonian to do new and interesting things. This is what's called Floquet engineering where you design a periodic Hamiltonian, which gets your Hamiltonian to do something that wouldn't be as easy to make with a time independent Hamiltonian, right? And so a lot of experiments are, are doing that kind of thing. And, and so that's another reason for interest in, interest in uh, Floquet systems. And then of course, okay, so, so uh, Floquet unitary would just be U of T plus one equals U of T. So we have a unitary operator. So for the circuit, right? And every time step, it's the same, right? And in this case, it, it can have uh, sort of sub steps. So U, right? And I would call this the Floquet unitary. U, so F sub F means Floquet. So, and, and UF might consist of N steps, U2. You know, so U1X, then U2, all the way up to UN, and then you repeat, right? And I'm gonna call the full thing one time step, one period of time. And so this circuit here has got, you know, this I could make a Floquet unitary that's that, it's got two layers of gates and then it repeats. And then I'd have a U1, U2, and then it repeats, right? That would be N equals two in this case. Right? So, and often, uh, you know, Floquet operators are written as products of unitaries. Because that way you can make each one of them simpler, but then the product makes something more complicated. 
Um, okay, so flow case systems again have uh, stroboscopically stationary eigenstates. Actually, I meant to say something. Okay, so to go through one period with the uh, Hamiltonian, the Floquet operator is the time ordering acting on e to the minus i integral zero to tau h of t dt. So this operator will evolve you through one full period of this periodic Hamiltonian that will produce the unitary operator that gets you uh, through one period, advances time by one period. And this capital T means put everything in time order over here. So expand out this exponential and every term, make sure it, it's in time order, right? So you don't have any commutators uh, messing it up. Okay. And then this operator has eigenstates, which are stroboscopic eigenstates in that they come back to the same state after one period. And then within the period, you can have some uh, what's called micro motion, where you have an eigenstate after a full period, but within the period, it does something and comes back to the same state. The mixed state comes back to the same state. The pure state comes back to the same state up to a phase. Right, but of course, an overall phase in front of a pure state is no change at all, right? As long as there's only one pure state, right? Okay, questions? Yeah, so yeah, just to sort of summarize where we, so we've got so so we could have general Hamiltonian or unitary, and this is sort of uh, unitary dynamics with no constraints, right? And here, in some sense, the simplest is uh, random unitary circuits where a bunch of things can be calculated uh, analytically. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> um, okay, now we can uh, add uh, say a conserved density. So say we have total spin that's conserved. Um, and here, now we can have, uh, can have transport of the conserved quantity we added. So we could have a general model with transport. And we, uh, this here is one of the simplest paces to study um, yeah, that's right, there's a whole bunch of seats right there. Yeah, so those of you on the end, there's seats right front there. Um, right, so a unitary circuit with a conserved density is a place where certain things about transport in closed unitary quantum many body system can be calculated analytically. Um, and now we can, we can go to, uh, we can impose periodic, H of T equals H of T plus tau. And then we have Floquet systems. So this is the first place where we have a whole set of dynamic eigenstates. So now we've got a lot of eigenstates. And so here we can, we can uh, it's this sort of simplest case where we can get many body localization because that requires eigenstates. And then we can make time independent Hamiltonian, right? So this, either this or, or uh, 
Same thing with yeah, mu of t, plus mu of t plus one. So make the Floquet systems. Then we can make it time independent, which we can't do with the circuits. And now we have a conserved energy. And we can look at energy transport down here. Um, and then you know, we could add other conserved quantities. So if we have conserved energy and other conserved quantities, we can look at thermal power kind of effects, you know, cross terms between energy transport and other transport. And then we can add other, so this is sort of two axes going from general to floquet to time independent, adding more conservation laws, right? Other axes in the big space of uh, systems you might think about. Um, so we might be in D dimensions. Look at it, different, different dimensions. Uh, we could have uh, only local interactions. Or we could add long range interactions. So that's certainly an interesting thing to think about is, you know, as we make the system, so its interactions are more and more non-local, how do things change? Um, and then, uh, so that's long range in space. And then there's also, are they, uh, you know, are the interactions, interactions, uh, I'm just going to say spin, few degrees of freedom. When I when I say spin, I often just mean degrees of degree of freedom, right? I'll just so you could have few spin interactions, or you could have many spin interactions. So th that's another thing one can vary. And then if you really go to the limit where you know everything is totally long range and many spins, that's random matrix theory, right? So random matrix theory would be no constraints over here in terms of locality or few spin operators, um, but you'd be up in this corner here. So random matrix theory is you know, way away from locality over here, but the general case up here, right? And then of course you could put you know, random matrices, you know, random matrices with time independent, or et cetera. So, so that's just sort of a crude outline of some of the things you might vary when you're asking about many quantum dynamics. Um, I mean, you're saying that the Hamiltonian is periodic, but in principle, it could change by uh, in, in such a way that the integral over the period is two, multiple of two pi, and we still have the same. Evolution operator, the floquet evolution. Like it could change by omega. Well, you're just talking about, I think you're just talking about the choice of the zero of energy. We can always shift the zero of energy. Uh, well, it could be. Right. So it could be fine dependent. Yeah, but let's say, let's say our Hamel. Without loss of generality, we could say our Hamiltonian is always traceless. So we choose the zero of energy, so the Hamiltonian is traceless, say for example, right? And then that would just get rid of that issue. And that's just a, that's just a sort of a basis choice. It's not really physics. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't have, you know, the current is the, yeah, to, uh, by, yeah, I mean a current of a conserved charge. Yeah. Low, you know, when I say transport, I mean in the limit of low frequency, long wavelength, right? If you're, it, yeah, it's true. You can do, if you have something which is almost conserved, you can have short time, short length scale transport. But yeah, I, I mean transport really in the hydrodynamic limit. Right. In order to have it in the hydrodynamic limit, you really have to have it be conserved. Yeah. 
Okay. 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 But that wouldn't change the physics at all. Yeah. Well, if I, I'm just saying I could eliminate that as a possibility by fixing it to be trace zero, right? Because of course the trace of a constant isn't zero, right? <laughs> But it's if it's if it's a constant, it's not physics, right? So it's just a it's just a variable change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't. It 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 introduces a phase which is unphysical, which is changing with time. But you know, we shouldn't distract ourselves with that. Right? That's why I like working with density matrices. The density matrix would be unaffected. No localization, you know, at least standard type of localization like Anderson localization, many body localization seems to require eigenstates. Yeah. So but you can have transport, you know, and it's certainly, you know, you can do a random unitary circuit with a conserved charge and study the transport, and you can actually get a bunch of stuff analytically that way. We have a paper about that with. With Vedica, Kamani. Yeah. So, okay, vanishing conductivity in that one is not connected to any kind of localization. Well, in that case, to have vanishing conductivity, you'd have to have all the gates be the identity, which is a type of localization, but it's kind of trivial. Um, yeah. Although I was, yeah, yeah, at least, you know, uh, standard Anderson localization and many body localization as far, I don't know of a generalization to them where it occurs in a system that, you know, doesn't have eigenstates, you know, flow K systems, definitely. Um, now, I suppose maybe, yeah, no, no, I should, I should be careful because with quasi-periodic, Anusha's going to talk, I don't know, do you, are you going to talk about this at all? Because there's also there's also uh, not just putting periodic drives, but putting two or three or some number of tones, so it's quasi periodic, and then you can get you can get various things which are you know intermediate between this and this, and it may be in there you can have Anderson localization. Hmm? The, well, ask yeah when when she gets to it, let's get back to that question. <laughs> I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, okay. Is it sufficient to consider just the eigenstates in the focus system? Yes. Um, the eigenstates, you mean the eigenstate of UF? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, there is some information that is not encoded. Yeah, the micro motion. Yeah, especially in the field of um, like focus topological insulators. You have some, uh, you, you won't get a, get a complete capacity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So between within one period, something might happen, which is topological, and you're ignoring it if you only look at it stroboscopically. Yeah. Reflected in the Yeah, yeah. 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 Would that be reflected in the problem? Yeah. Uh, ask again if uh, if you can see where it might have come in. Okay. So thermalization, as was just mentioned. So I'm going to talk next about thermalization. Okay. And so thermalization. Well, the basic question of thermalization. So so now we're talking about a a system undergoing unitary dynamics. And the question, so thermalization is, uh, you know, does our system 
under this unitary dynamics act as a bath for itself and uh, under the dynamics at long times bring all subsystems, let's say small, as I'll say later, small subsystems um, to thermal equilibrium. with each other. So this is really, you know, is our system a bath? You know, what is a bath? First we have to, you know, what is a bath? What's, what does a bath have to be able to do? And then is our system a bath? Um, and what do we mean by a lot of these words? Um, and so if the answer to this is yes, that's thermalization. I'm talking about at long times. Does this happen at long times? Okay, so you know, thermalization, you know, it's a it's a yes, no question, you know, kind of like phase transitions. And we know from phase transitions, these questions don't really have sharp answers unless you take a limit of a large system, right? So in order for this to be, you know, this is you know, a sharp question, in the limits n to infinity and t to infinity, right? that's where you know, we could, actually have a phase transition between a regime that did thermalize and a regime that didn't thermalize, does and doesn't. Um, but but uh, in strong differences, uh, are clear in small systems. So we don't just ask this question for large systems. In order to make the question sharp, we only ask it for large systems. But once we understand what we're talking about, we can study it in small systems, just like it with a phase transition. Once you understand what a phase transition is and you know a little bit about finite size scaling, you can study phase transitions in very small systems. And it's the same, same story here. Um, and so you can have strong changes in the extent to which a system thermalizes, you know, as you change some parameters in, in a small system. And let me just mention the, the, the first paper, which is usually not cited, looking at thermalization in small systems is uh, Jensen and Shankar, PRL 1985. And this was a, a seven spin chain. So they were looking at a, just a, a, a chain of seven spin a halves, nearest neighbor interactions. And they basically asked, you know, does it thermalize? Are the eigenstates thermal? And they got good evidence that they chose a Hamiltonian where that was true to a very good approximation. Um, this was you know, well before the general subject, other people started writing about it. This is, this is uh, the Shankar <laughs> from Yale, who, but you know, it's, an, it's an important numerical paper. You wouldn't think he would have yeah. been on a numerical paper. Yeah. Jensen and Shankar. So there it's a closed system, no bath. Yeah, yeah, this is a closed, this, this was a Hamiltonian, seven spin spin H. So they were doing time independent Hamiltonian, right? Because of course, you know, who was even talking about flow case systems in 1985, right? Probably some atomic physicists were, 
because the flow case system is just the rotating wave approximation, right? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a time independent Hamilton. It was the tilted field Ising model. Yeah. You know, you know, we rediscovered what's the best Hamiltonian for doing this, but they had already found it. So um, you had longitudinal and transfer field? You take an Ising model and you put a tilted field, both longitudinal and transverse. That's a very nice model for studying. Uh, you know, for, for me, if you tilt that and get all the parameters nice, it thermalizes really nicely. And, and they found that. And then other people rediscovered it, you know, 20 years later. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you have to be, it, well, the best way to phrase the thermalization is, is to put a little clause here at almost all times, <laughs> right? So now if there is this phenomenon of recurrence. So if you have a finite system and you go to infinite time, you're gonna get all sorts of recurrences. So there'll be particular times, which are extremely rare, where it do, it's no longer thermal. But if you put in the clause at almost all times, then you don't really have to worry about, you, you don't really have to worry too much about the order of limits. Um, yeah. although, although if you have transport as an issue, right? If you take N to infinity first, now you have infinite distances, and you'll never equilibrate things which are infinitely far apart. So, so you really should take T to infinity with N or before N, right? If you really take N to infinity in a local system and you have it out of equilibrium over infinite distances, you know, then the time scale to equilibrate is infinite, right? And so, so, so that's a problem that, so yeah, you, you do have to think about the order of limits there, but it's, it's not that important. Uh, you know, you can do it the wrong way. Um, yeah. Uh, it depends on the system. Yeah, you can make initial states in, in systems that are local, even with no conservation laws, you can make initial states that have a thermalization time that grows with the linear size of the system. But it is also possible to make it for one. Well, you know, if we're saying thermalization for all initial states, if the system is local, I don't think you can make it order one. Oh. I, I can show you how to do that. But oh, that, that's you can, very oh. you can make special states yes, that will thermalize, but they'll. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so most interacting quantum systems, you know, that are generic, do thermalize. So thermalization is the generic behavior. Um, but there are exceptions, and the exceptions are of a lot of interest. Yeah, so I, I want to put another clause. Thermal equilibrium with, uh, you know, of order one thermodynamic. Uh, constants or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. When we say thermal equilibrium, it's at a given temperature, at a given chemical potential, if there's a conserved charge. And let's say there's just order one number of those, or if we're doing the generic case, there's none, right? right? If, if, we, if we talk about thermalization of a system with no conservation laws, that's just thermalizing to maximum entropy. And there's no temperature, there's no chemical potential or anything because there's no conserved quantities. 
Now, one of the exceptions is integrable systems. Integrable systems. And these uh, have their own type of thermalization, but they have an infinite number of conservation laws, right? And so one can talk about thermalization of integrable systems. This is generalized thermalization of some sort. I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, uh, some of the experts on that will be here next week, but I, I, I don't know whether they'll be talking about it either. Um, yeah, the other thing, got anybody localization written up here. Let me just put its acronym because I'm so MBL means many body localization. And these are different because they have uh, an infinite number of conserved observables. So in that sense, they don't thermalize like standard thermal equilibrium, which would be just set by a few thermodynamic parameters. Um, there's also uh, quantum scars, which is another exception. And then there's you know other other constrained systems of various sorts. You know, I, I'm not sure uh, I could list them all. So there's there's a number of exceptions. Um, the only one I'm really gonna spend time on is this one. Um, so when I'm talking about thermalization, until I get to MBL, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, systems, you know, with, if there are any conserved quantities, it's just one or two or three or zero. Um, okay. Is that why you need, the Jens and Schenkar, they need a longitudinal field to make it not integral? Yeah, you need, right. Yeah, they found a nice, strongly non-integrable chain, spin chain. And it's in some sense, the simplest spin chain that's non-integrable. You, know, you gotta have an interaction. The simplest interaction is an Ising interaction. And then once you have that, you can't put a longitudinal field, you can't put a transverse field because those are both integrable. And so they put a tilted field with both of them, right? And, and that's, you know, that's, a, that's a nice model. I just uh, emailed Shankar asking what possessed. <laughs> he had a, yeah. <laughs> Anusha? Yeah. Is there any any quantitative Yeah, well, okay, so if you have an extensive conserved quantity that is just a sum over sites and they all commute with each other, that's simpler to work with. That's what Anisha is pointing out. Now, um you know, the energy is special because it not only is conserved, but it also gives the dynamics, right? Now, it's an interesting question. If I had another conserved quantity that wasn't a sum of local commuting terms, but wasn't the energy, you know, of course, that's what happens in a lot of the integrable systems. The question is, could you have just one of those and then ask, yeah, that's a good question, but I, I don't know of an example. They're probably... Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Seems like there should be an example. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now I wanna start, uh, yeah, talking a little bit of, yeah. You know, what do we mean by thermalization and what don't we mean? Okay, 
So, so, so now let's get specific. So let's say we have N uh, spin one halves, also known as qubits. Um, okay, so we have, uh, you know, Hilbert space dimension two to the N. And we have four to the N operators because we have the Pauli identity X, Y, and Z for each spin. So a complete set of all operators on this system is a product, outer product of one of the four Pauli operators on each of the spins. And so there's a total of four to the N such operators. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that's not falling up on her. That's ed, 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 that's about. I, I'm I'm coming to that. <laughs> let, let, let me continue. No, you're getting ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. Just for the purposes of recording, when somebody has a question. Yeah. Okay. So. He's gone. <laughs> he asked the question and left. <laughs> no. So, so it was it was pointed out that if our system has eigenstates, uh, the projector onto every eigenstate is a conserved quantity, right? And so, don't we always have an infinite number of conservation laws? And uh, we do. Now, at one point, I threw in a word here, which I'm going to get to. Yeah. So here. Conserved observables. So I have to, I would say those are not observables. And I'll, and I'll try to uh, tell you what I mean by that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, right. Right. So now we're talking about n spin and halves. We got four to the n operators. And now, of course, the simplest operators are ones which are the identity on almost every spin and non-identity, say, on just one spin. Okay, so let's consider let's consider the operator uh, you know, A, which is at time zero. So I'm going to give my operators some dynamics, and I'll tell you in a minute what I mean by that. And let's say this is, let's just say it's as an example. Z sub n. So the spin number n, it's the Z Pauli operator and times the identity on everything else, right? Right. Whenever we say an operator and we don't mention the other degrees of freedom, it's always an outer product with the identity on all the other sites, all the other degrees of freedom. You know, that's something we just never say, but it's always there. Um, okay. Now, okay. So let's. And we have our system. It's got it's got a you know a row of t, and it's got some unitary evolution. So let's. I'm going to talk generally. So we have a unitary of t, which uh, means the time evolution from time zero to time t. That might be a product of some some circuit operators or or uh, you know a thing like this, but integrated all the way to the final time. Okay, so U of T gives me the dynamics, whatever it is. I'm being general. Okay, and so now the expectation value of A at time zero is, of course, trace uh, rho of zero, A of zero. That's what we mean by the expectation value. And now let me, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do. Uh, Schrodinger time evolution. I emphasize that because it's going to look like Heisenberg evolution, but it isn't. It's Schrodinger. Um, and so I'm just going to make a variable change and just throw in a bunch of U's in here. Uh, but it's really just the identity. So U 
of t, rho of zero, u dagger of t, u of t, a of zero, u dagger of t. I didn't do anything. I just put in the identity twice, right? And now what's this? This is just the state of the system at later times, right? So this is equal to trace rho of t, a of t, where this is the operator time evolved in the Schrodinger picture. So a of t is equal to u of t, a of zero, a dagger of t. And this is just the, all the same thing. I haven't done, changed anything, right? I've just rewritten things different ways. But then this is, of course, then the expectation value of a of t at time t. And so why am I doing this? I'm saying any property of the initial state as an expectation value of an operator, right? Every property of the initial state, I can find some operator that's an expectation value of, at least any linear property. Um, there is a corresponding property of the final state, which is exactly the same, right? And that's because the dynamics is unitary, right? It, every, it's perfectly reversible. No information about the initial state is lost. It's somewhere in the system. And this tells you, right, if A at time zero has some expectation value, say it's way out of thermal equilibrium, where is that information later? It's in this operator here. This operator has an expectation value, which is way out of equilibrium, right? So, so this is just saying, you know, under unitary time evolution, nothing is lost. Okay. Now, if, if rho naught is thermal, thermal equilibrium, then rho t is also, right, thermal equilibrium means equilibrium. You run the dynamics, you, you stay at equilibrium. So rho of t is also, right? And so that tells you that uh, A of t, t is equal to A equilibrium, and it's independent of t, independent of time. Of course, it depends, right? It'll depend on the temperature, the chemical potential, if you have Right, you know, this a particular thermal equilibrium is specified by some thermodynamic parameters, but you know, as this operator evolves this way in equilibrium, right, in equilibrium, it's going to evolve this way, but its, expect, it's uh, expectation value is always uh, the equilibrium value, right? Okay, so 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 that's starting with equilibrium now, uh. Uh, if if rho of zero is not thermal and let's say the expectation value of a of zero at time zero is not equal to a equilibrium so we've pre prepared a non-equilibrium initial state and this particular observable can see that it's non-equilibrium, right? Then A of t, t is always non-thermal. So the system is out of equilibrium observable, you know, sorry, I shouldn't say observable. If there's some operators whose expectation values show you your system is out of thermal equilibrium in its initial state, you will have at all times some other operators, the thing evolved to a later time, which will also tell you the system is out of thermal equilibrium. So how could it thermalize, right? And the point is that if you consider all operators as observables, the system doesn't thermalize, 
The system just does a unitary time evolution and it moves all its properties around amongst all these operators, but it doesn't move towards equilibrium, right? Uh, if you consider all, um, all operators as observables. And, and, and for me, this was, you know, first pointed out clearly, probably other people had said it before, but this, there's this guy, Lifchowski, PRA 2013, where he said this very clearly. Um, I'm not saying he was the first one to say it clearly, but he was the first one to say it clearly to me. <laughs> in, in, you know, it was in print, I've never met him, uh, but. Uh, um, and what, what he says is, is, you know, to define thermalization, you need to restrict to a subset, a very, very small subset of all operators. I'll, I'll try to get to that. I'm, I'm getting to that. Did I write observable? Yeah, I said observable. I haven't written it yet. Yeah, I got to be careful. Yeah, I said it over there. The humidity is lower here than in Princeton, particularly today. I guess today in Princeton, it's supposed to be the most humid day we've had all year. Um, Right, so so, so yeah, so there's sort of two situations, you know, as I said, there's thermalization as sharply defined where you're taking the limits of large systems, but then there's thermalization in small systems where you're not talking about sharp distinctions, but you're talking about strong quantitative distinctions in a small system. So, First, let me you know, say we have a small system. Right. And so either, so just, just to be concrete, say this is a system that's small enough, it's a model, and we can just exactly diagonalize it and do everything exactly. And so then we can we can look at every operator, right? Because you know. It's small enough system, you know, we got the whole Hamiltonian, we diagonalize it, we can look at every, op we can we can look at any operator we want. We probably couldn't look at all of them because that might be too much work, but we could look at any operator we choose to look at. Um, and then also we know in the lab, if it's a small enough system, you can do complete state tomography. And so you can run your experiment and you can look at all operators. People really do this you know, for small enough systems where they look at the expectation value of every single operator, and that's called complete state tomography, right? And under those circumstances, all four to the N operators are observables. And if the system was closed, of course, in the laboratory, it wasn't, but in the ED calculation, it was. And if you consider all, uh, all operators as quantities that, you know, are relevant, to thermalization, you would say, no, it didn't thermalize. It, it stayed essentially in the same state it started in, right? Which is basically the Heisenberg picture of time evolution, right? The Heisenberg picture of quantum time evolution, the state does not change, only the operators change, right? Um, right, so for small systems, we, we, you know, we need, to uh, choose which operators to consider to be observables. And then ask, you know, is the system observably out of thermal equilibrium? And typically what you might do here is restrict it to say all one spin and two spin operators. 
that would be an example. So you might just say, I'm going to consider all one spin and two spin operators to be my observable. And anything higher order than that, I'm going to consider to be non observable. And then I can ask, is my state observably out of equilibrium? And then with time, those one and two spin operators that were out of equilibrium at time zero do this time evolution with these unitaries. And if these unitaries are complicated, it will produce operators that at long times are many spin operators and are no longer observables. So the fact that the system was observably out of thermal equilibrium at the beginning gets hidden by this operator evolution of moving that information from an observable operator to a non-observable one. And that's what dissipation is in closed quantum systems undergoing unitary dynamics. Yeah, I forgot to say one thing right at the beginning, which is if you have an open system and there is an important effect happening due to its environment, one option you have is take part of the environment as big as you can handle and put it inside your system and now consider that environment as part of your closed system. Right? And that's you know, conceptually a good thing, sometimes computationally a good thing, but conceptually it's definitely a nice one way to think about decoherence and dissipation. Um, sorry, someone had their, yeah. Considering the equity value of the operator to be volatile and compared to the equilibrium value, why are we doing A of T? Right. So I would have Well, A of T is interesting because it, you know, it is what the thing was at the early state. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to get to this. I'm going to get to this. Leo? <laughs> Again, let, let me, uh, so Leo's asking about dissipation and decoherence, and let me, let me try to get to that. Although I'm almost out of time. And the organizer says, you shouldn't ask any more questions until then. Oh, oh, you're just warning me 10 minutes left. Okay, it's not a question. It's a command. <laughs> yeah, no, wait till the end for you <laughs> and Leah. But the students, you can ask questions, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Right. Now, for a very large system, so very large end, You know, there is this exponentially many operators. And you know, if you think of the complexity of an experiment to measure all those operators, it's just totally unrealistic, right? So for very large N in any particular experimental setup, uh, only some set of few spin operators are observable. And you know exactly which operators are observable and which ones aren't will depend on the experiment and it might depend on choices the experimentalists made in their priorities. But when the system gets large, whatever set of operators are observable is a, an infinitesimal fraction of these four to the n operators. So in a real system, as n gets large, almost all operators are not observables, right? And that's not our choice. That's a limitation we live with. And I don't think we're gonna ever overcome it. We're just gonna go a little further in increasing this set of operators you can observe, but it's it's never 
going to be something that scales up as four to the n, right? It's it's going to be much much smaller, right? So for example, we would say uh, n spin operators with n less than or equal to k are observable. So that would be a typical thing to assume as a reasonable thing. Um, and then what you have is you have n choose k, well, maybe more to the k, something like this, n choose k four to the k observables, right? Because you, know, you choose which spins do I have an observable on in each of these well, three to the k. Because when we say when we say an n spin operator, we mean it's not the identity on n spins, right? So, so this would be the number of uh, number of observables, and it's only growing as you know n to the k times three to the k, as opposed to four to the n, which is much much slower. Although the, you know they both grow fast, but this is much much faster. Yeah. Here, I mean practical sense. But I'm asserting that's a practical sense that's never going to change, right? It's, I think it's, you know, even with all the fantasies of development of quantum technology, nobody's suggesting this will change. Hmm? That, 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 the, that when you go to a large system, you have a scaling of your experiment so that all four to the n operators are observables in practice. I don't think anybody's proposing that that will change, right? You, know, you might be able to pick some special set of n spin operators where you can go up to a very large K for a very small special set of operators, right? That, that you have to do if you wanna build a quantum computer, you have to be able to pick a few operators where you let this K get big, right? That's really what you need, right? But still, it's a very small number of operators compared to that 40, right? So almost in the limit of a large system, almost all operators are not observables. The set of observables is very small. And dissipation in a closed system with unitary dynamics is, you could say, quantum information moving from observable operators to non-observable operators by this dynamics. And so you're, you're not bringing the system to thermal equilibrium, really. You're just hiding the fact that it's not in thermal equilibrium. <laughs> At least that's one way of saying it. Although we, I, I prefer to define thermal equilibrium as thermal equilibrium observably, that if it's only non-observably out of thermal equilibrium, that's still thermal equilibrium. And so someone asked about the projector onto eigenstates. The projector onto eigenstates is one of the non-observable, that's a class of non-observable operators, right? And so although those are conserved, they're not observably conserved. And so they don't have observable, well, that you can't talk about their transport or, yeah. Well, you know, I think, as I said, picking a few operators and letting K get big is realistic, right? So people do experiments where they measure long string operators, right? But they're not measuring all long string operators. They're measuring a very special subset of long string operators, right? And so that's fun, right? And so in that particular case, they've chosen to make the operators that are observable a, a set which includes these string operators. And that's fine, but it's still very you know, infinitesimal number of operators compared to all of them. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, not that I'm aware of. So the question is, could the transition from thermalizing to non-thermalizing happen 
on changing this parameter, not changing this, you know, not changing, uh, you know, properties of the unitary, but changing. I'm not aware of it, but it would be interesting if there was an example. Uh, yeah, I don't think at finite k that could happen, but you know, I don't. I don't want to be dogmatic about it because in this subject, you know, new things get found. Yeah. Well, I think about a mixed trait as an ensemble of cross traits, and I'm trying to think about the whole distribution of the uh, of the model. Like the distribution of the expectation value is that of the distribution of some or the distribution of the correlates of should, should the whole distribution be just yeah, I think the probability distribution of the right if I of course, if I got the expectation value of an operator, I measured it many times and I got the probability distribution. Yeah, so that's so any, you know, that would just be the probability distribution of the eigenvalues of A. Yeah. And if A is observable, its probability distribution should also be observable. Yeah. Because, you know, think of doing the experiment. That's exactly what you do, right? Right. But if you do the experiment, you every run you get a value, so you get the distribution for free, right? Of course, you know there's con there's considerations of noise and fidelity, but um, yeah. Should I should I stop, Anusha? Let me, let me just draw a picture which I might be able to draw in one minute, but not say what I want to say about it. You can go a couple of minutes over if it's natural. Non-conserved observables. So this is a small set and these can be out of equilibrium. And then here's non-observables, very large set. And then what the dynamics does, so the unitary dynamics, you know, one view of unitary dynamics is a flow given by this in operator space and a system that thermalizes the non-conserved observables will with time become non-observables. So the fact that they were initially out of equilibrium gets hidden. And then another statement is, this is almost all operators. So if you take a given state, almost all operators, their expectation value is at thermal equilibrium. And so, of course, the operators that leave here and go over have to be replaced. And so some very special fine-tuned linear combinations of these guys go down and become observables, but they were generically at thermal equilibrium. Uh, and so that's the way the system goes to equilibrium is it, it always, no matter what the initial state is, has many, almost all operators at thermal equilibrium it has a very small number of operators out of thermal equilibrium. And then the ones that are out of thermal equilibrium become non-observable and get replaced by things that were at equilibrium. So this is essentially how uh, a view, this is one view of how closed systems under unitary dynamics go to thermal equilibrium, how they dissipate. And if our system includes an environment and the subsystem is viewed as an open system, this is a view of decoherence as well, right? Because decoherence really is, you know, well, I, let me not get into that. Okay, so, so I'll, I'll stop there for today. Um, more questions? Two position of kind of thermalization, even integrable terms like system, 
Yeah. Yeah. That, that might be a very trivial example of the Yeah. But you would have the difference in that if you increased K by one, now one more of your conserved quantities is observable. And now the set of thermal states you have grew, right? Whereas if I had a system with say only conserved energy and only temperature defining the thermal states, I would have you know thermal equilibrium at each temperature. And as I increase, you know, if K equals one or two or three, it wouldn't change the set of thermal states I had, right? So, so that would be one difference that you know, as I redefine what I mean by observables, my set of thermal equilibrium states would just steadily grow in, in the integrable systems with this way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you possibly uh, contrast this view of quantum thermalization with the more traditional view of like classical thermalization? What would you say is the key distinction or difference from the way we used to think about it? Oh. Yeah. So, Quantum pure states can thermalize and be thermal at one time. So you start the system in a quantum pure state, you run it out to some very long time, a typical time, it's thermal at that time, okay? Now, a classical pure state, which is one configuration, I run it out to some very long time and look at that time, it's just in one configuration. It's not at thermal, it's observably out of thermal equilibrium because it's in a specific configuration. Now, we're, this discussion is about not real classical systems, but fictitious classical systems with many degrees of freedom obeying Newton's equations, right? Which don't really exist, right? But that's what we were talking about. I assume that's what you were asking about was, was fictitious classical systems. <laughs> yeah. I can't do that with the pure state quantum mechanically either. So you should object to the whole discussion. Right, but if, if, if you won't allow me to talk about classical pure states in many body systems, you shouldn't allow me to talk about quantum pure states in many body systems either because they're both impossible. They have things in common, but they're not as easy to produce at all, right? A, a quantum pure state in a many body system is just as impossible to produce. Well, of course the classical one is impossible to produce just because the classical system doesn't even exist. Right, so 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 we have to be careful about what we you know. But this is a theoretical yeah, you know, it's a theoretical discussion, right? But there is a distinction, right? If we accept that you can talk about pure states, and we accept that you can talk about classical systems that have many degrees of freedom and obey Newton's equations, right? Then there is this distinction, which is you know very clear, which has to do with classical pure states being points and quantum many body states being able to get entangled, right? That's the difference, right? Yeah, right, you've you got four and a half hours to, to uh, contradict me on the schedule. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, 